2019. I'm Amy Joy Tofty, NCFCA Director of Education, and we are recording live from the University of Northwestern in St. Paul, Minnesota. NCFCA is passionate about equipping students with the necessary skills to influence culture and communicate truth. This morning I was reading in Luke chapter 5, and it's the scene where Jesus gets into the boat with Simon Peter, and he says to him, Getting into the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land, and he sat down and taught the people from the boat. And when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep and let down your nets for a catch. Now, there's something you need to know here, and that is that Peter had already been out all night trying to fish, and he had caught nothing. And so this instruction seems a little odd to him. But rather than say probably what he was thinking, he said, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish and their nets were breaking. And I just was struck this morning as we're starting our summit that there are always opportunities for us to let down our nets just a little deeper and to catch more great things. And that's what the summit is all about. So thank you for joining us this morning, for embracing the mission. Our mission at NCFCA is more than words. It's the purpose that motivates everything we do. Our goal is not to train up gifted communicators who can entertain an audience, but rather to train up godly communicators who stand firm in truth and point others to Christ. In this discussion, we'll examine the importance of truth, the challenges facing our youth, and the mission that motivates what we do. Throughout the session, our viewing audience is welcome to ask questions by clicking on the button at the bottom of your screen. And we'll answer those questions during our live question and answer session. If you need technical support, please email summittech at ncfca.org. And stay tuned for our fantastic giveaways, which include two copies of the Disciple Making Parent, and a free SAT Prep Genius tuition voucher offered by our friends at HSLDA's Online Academy. Joining me today are NCFCA Director Kim Cromer and NCFCA Board Chairman and Founding Member Christy Scheip. Thank you both for joining us. We're so Good morning, Amy. Well, Kim, I'm going to go ahead and get started. Here's Christy. Hi. Good morning, Christy. Good morning. How are you? Great. How is the weather on the East Coast? It is sunny and humid. Wonderful. <laughs> yes. Not so different in the Midwest. Yeah. <laughs> you have been involved in the league for some time. Can you yes. tell me what you enjoy most about NCFCA? I have been in involved for a while, Amy Joy, and I have the great privilege of leading this organization alongside some of the most devoted Christian leaders in the country. Um, as we help our students learn to develop the skills necessary to think critically and communicate effectively. Our vision is that these students learn to address life issues from a biblical worldview in a manner that glorifies God. So the enjoyment comes um, often from reading testimonies like this one that I received last week from one of our longtime affiliates. She said, early this morning, the start of a glorious summer day, I was sitting outside thanking the Lord for his many blessings. Having finished 22 years of homeschooling this spring, with our youngest graduating from high school, I was reflecting upon the blessings of all of those years when NCFCA came to mind. Without question, being involved in the NCFCA was one of the greatest blessings that we participated in in all of those 22 years. 
giving my children oratory skills, logic building capabilities, persuasive abilities, the departure of the fear of standing up and articulating in front of a group of people. The list goes on and on, she said. As executive director, I'm blessed to get to read testimonies like this on a regular basis um, from our parents. But I'm also on the other end of those testimonies as our own girls participated in NCFCA throughout their high school years. And in their adult lives, it's really given them the confidence to stand up for what they believe in a situation where their viewpoint may not be the most popular one, as well as the skills needed to examine a statement for truth. So NCFCA provides opportunities for us all, for our students, for our parents, for coaches, for leadership, to all learn to reason together at a time in history where division seems to be the theme of almost every sector of society. The league is laying the groundwork for Christian young people to come together in the pursuit of truth and the excellence for the glory of God the Father. That's so great. that's why I love it. Thank you, Kim. I appreciate that. Now, Chris, you are one of the founding members. So tell me what led you to first develop a debate league? Well, um, to answer that question, I'm going to tell you a little of the history of my life. I am the oldest child of Mike and Vicki Ferris. Um, Mike Ferris is the founder of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association. So I was part of a big homeschooling family and was homeschooled from second grade all the way through high school. Um, was a natural argumentative person, let me say. <laughs> and, um, but I never had the opportunity to participate in speech or debate all throughout my elementary and secondary education. Um, however, when I went to Cedarville University, that was the first time I got to join a debate team. I loved it so much. Um, my dad helped me all the time. And he and I both caught the vision for bringing this activity to homeschool students because I had not had that opportunity growing up. And we thought, hey, let's start a homeschool debate league. So that began in 1997 while I was still a student at Cedarville. Then I um, ran the program for four years until the birth of my second child, at which point we transitioned into NCFCA, a separate organization, have added so many different events. Now we're two debate styles, moot court, and multiple speech events. And throughout those 24 years, <laughs> um, I've been on the board of directors for most of that time. Mm -hmm. That's great. Now, it seems to me I've heard a story yes. that perhaps your dad had to push you just a little bit to get this off the ground. Can you tell us about that? Yes, when he first mentioned, hey, let's start a homeschool debate league, I thought he was joking. He gets a lot of start organization ideas. <laughs> so um, so I didn't take it that seriously. But I was on my I was home for Christmas break. I was on my way out the door to a New Year's Eve party and he said, Where are those debate league rules that I told you to write? You're not going to your party until you get those rules written. So that was the real start of all of this. Fantastic. I love that. Well, here we are almost 25 years later. So let's talk about NCFCA today. Why do we do what we do here at NCFCA? Well, like I said, I've been here since day one and our vision and mission has not changed. Speech and debate skills are incredibly valuable for every Christian student. I know how valuable they've been in my life. And like I said, my dad and I just had a vision for bringing those skills to Christian students. Communication is one of the unique aspects of being human. It's a cornerstone of just our nature as human beings. And it makes connection with other human beings possible. And then when you look at the culture today, communication is such a cornerstone. Um, it's just expanding rapidly all the different avenues for communication. And we have a vision for young people who love Jesus, mm -hmm. who know how to reason, how to research, how to think, right? How to listen to other people and their perspective how to analyze what's being said, how to solve problems and create solutions, not just complain. 
mm -hmm. how to connect with people, how to communicate effectively and winsomely. If if young people who love Jesus had those skills, I mean, this is these are young people who can make a big impact for the kingdom of God. Absolutely. It reminds me of what Kim was saying in that opening testimony that our goal is for our students to take the skills that they learn in NCFCA and then go use them wherever God calls them. So let's talk about our alumni a little bit. Where are they? Um, are they all politicians? Do they all wear suits all the time? What does that look like? They're not all politicians. They don't all wear suits all the time. In fact, whatever attire you can imagine for any career is what they're wearing. You know, we have students, um, our alumni who are out now around the globe, literally business, education, media, music, politics, advocacy, mission, military. Um, many of them are now raising families of their own. Mm -hmm. And so these communication skills are valuable in every area of life. And, you know, whether they competed in one tournament or whether they were um, longtime competitors like the one from the testimony who competed and competed successfully from a worldly terms, you know, up through our national tournament, um, that success is going to be um, defined in different ways. You know, so it, whether it's just them having the ability to stand up in front of a group of people or even to have a, a tough conversation with a friend when they have an opposing viewpoint, for them to be able to stand ground, to be able to be winsome, to be articulate, to listen carefully, like Christy said, to be able to think and, and articulate truth and dig through and reason together. So I think, you know, everything that we do here at NCFCA is really wrapped around the idea that we want to equip them for whatever God calls them to. And it doesn't have to be something just in particular. That's great. Now, I know over the, the past few years, NCFCA has taken steps to more clearly define who we are. So can you talk a little bit about the addition of our position statements to our original statement of faith, which is the Nicene Creed? Sure. Um, so the Nicene Creed has been accepted by, you know, Christians of all types for thousands of years. And that's our statement of faith. And so we invite everyone who shares in that broad statement of faith to join us. Um, but we recently added some additional um, statements on a couple of other issues. And those issues are first, the inerrancy of scripture, and second, um, the Nashville statement, which is related to marriage, sexuality, and gender issues. We know that agreement to these two statements on inerrancy and sexuality and all of that, that doesn't make someone a Christian. That doesn't define who is a Christian and who is not a Christian. Salvation is by faith in Jesus Christ alone. We believe that firmly. So the reason that we added these position papers on inerrancy and on sexuality and gender is because of our mission. Um, I think Kim already mentioned it, but in, in a summary statement, our mission is to give Christian students competitive opportunities to address life issues from a biblical worldview mm -hmm. in a manner that glorifies God. And it's that phrase, from a biblical worldview that pushed us to, to add these statements, um, we felt the need as the board of directors to further clarify what we mean by a biblical worldview. So we're not trying to define this for all people at all times ever, but we're just defining it for our organization. What does the NCFCA board of directors believe is a biblical worldview? Um, so because we want our students to address the issues within the league from that perspective. So to be specific on inerrancy, we want our students to address life issues from the point of view that agrees with the idea that scripture is God's word. Mm -hmm. And that as Psalm 119, 160 says, all your words are true, all your righteous laws are eternal. And we also want students to address the issues of marriage, sexuality, and gender from the point of view that the Christian church has agreed upon for 2000 years up till now, it's been being challenged, but 
Um, we want students to have the worldview that God created sex to be enjoyed only in marriage between one man and one woman, and that God created man in his own image, as Genesis 127 says, in the image of God, he created him, male and female, he created them. So these statements were added just to clarify what we mean when we say a biblical worldview. That's great. So it's obvious that NCFCA is intent on keeping the why and maintaining our excellence in the what we do. But we're also updating the how. So let's talk about recent changes in the league. Christy, can you share some about our eligibility changes? Absolutely. So last year, for the first time, we um, changed our eligibility to allow students, Christian students, to be in the league regardless of their type of educational choice. Mm -hmm. So that means we were no longer just limited to homeschool students. And we did that for two reasons. First of all, because defining what is homeschooling in high school is getting harder and harder. Yeah. Um, most homeschool high school students aren't really at home <laughs> very much. And being in the league as I have been for the, since the beginning, I can personally tell you how hard it's been. You know, do they have to be home in the home 51% of the time? Can they take outside classes? Can they be dual enrolled? It's just all of these questions that are tricky. Um, and then secondly, we realized that what really unites us is not our educational choices, but our faith. Mm -hmm. And we realized that they're not, not all homeschoolers are Christians and share that biblical worldview I was talking about, mm -hmm. right? And not all Christians who do share that biblical worldview are homeschoolers. So we realized we want to reach those students mm -hmm. who, um, believe as we do, who share our values, who share our mission, who share this worldview. And most private and public school students don't have access to a league like ours that is exclusively Christian. So, um, you know, our name has always been the National Christian Forensics and Communications Association. So we really wanted to reach out to all Christian students who would share our vision and mission and invite them to join us and learn these skills. And Kim, have those eligibility changes resulted in any significant changes in what we do? You know, interesting question, Amy Joy. It's one I had an opportunity to sit down with some affiliates just recently um, to address. I don't believe that these eligibility changes are going to make significant difference in what we do for a couple of reasons. One, what Christy pointed out, it's really already been happening. Our team has been watching the evolution of homeschooling for several years, and we really believe that these updates are an extension of that natural progression. Mm -hmm. You know, we have had students participating who don't fit into a very traditional definition of homeschooling for a number of years. We've seen that progression. We've seen folks participating in lots of other things. So our eligibility change simply removes the barrier to compete for those Christian students and their families. The important thing that I think our current affiliates need to understand is that our standard of excellence is not gonna change. There are the same expectations for parents and chaperones of students who may come from a public or a private school. Um, they, may, they have to have someone who is specifically appointed um, to be very involved in order for them to participate. Right. So it's not a case of, you know, the, the school's going to put 50 kids on a bus and bring them to our tournaments and just either drop them off or have one or two coaches along. They're really still going to have those same things. I do think it's also important to remember that we're going to still take feedback. We have those feedback forms after every tournament. Um, so if you're not getting those, please let us know. Email our office. Um, we'll be sure that you get those after every tournament that you attend because we want your feedback. We are watching carefully and we're not um, afraid to make changes, you know, as they are necessary, but I don't actually think that's gonna be the case. Great. So. Kim, as the executive director of the league, you provide oversight for the organization. And I understand that there are some tournament structure changes for this year. So can you talk to us about those and tell us why the league decided to offer those alternatives? Absolutely. Um, we want to meet the needs of our affiliates. That's the bottom line. 
So this year we plan to offer some two day tournament options in each region. Um, feedback over the last few years through those forms I was referencing um, was that it's more and more difficult for families to travel and be engaged in a tournament for three or more days at a time. You know, schedules, missing classes, finances, um, missing church regularly. Those are all factors that affiliates mentioned as challenges and hurdles um, for being able to participate. And again, as Christy mentioned, our board is really committed to coming alongside families um, to support them in their discipleship, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and these options will allow us to do that. You know, with the um, opportunity, we're going to have some low barrier entry points for new families as they begin their speech and debate journey. Um, and our goal will be that this will encourage families to give it a try and really um, that our mission will be furthered because we'll be able to train more Christian communicators. Great. Well, Christy, I want to thank you so much for joining us today. I know we have the privilege of hearing from you again at several of the sessions. So thank you so much for being here. Absolutely. I'm excited for this whole summit. And to our listening audience, we are so thankful to our sponsors who have graciously donated our fantastic giveaways. So HSLDA Online Academy has partnered with Jean Burke and her award-winning college prep genius curriculum to offer SAT Prep Genius. This live interactive eight week course explores the logical patterns of SAT questions and teaches students how to recognize obvious clues and find correct answers. So the winner of today will receive one free SAT Prep Genius tuition voucher to be used in the fall of 2019 or spring of 2020 at the HSLDA Online Academy. And the winner is Jocelyn at Jocelyn and Dance. So thank you, Jocelyn, for tuning in today. Next, we have two copies of The Disciple Making Parent by Chap Bettis. As parents, we have been given eternal soul's influence, and we want to disciple them to follow Christ. Sometimes we just don't know how. So The Disciple Making Parent will give parents confidence in that journey. And the winners of these books are Jacob at Jacob2339 and Kangza. So thank you for tuning in today. Last but not least, for our entire listening audience, in addition to the two copies of the Disciple Making Parent that we're giving away today, everyone can receive the audiobook for free. So just email audiobook at theapollosproject.com with NCFCA in the subject line, and you will receive a free ebook. To claim your prizes, please email summit tech at ncfca.org, and we will get those prizes sent to you. Well, over the past two decades, NCFCA has been blessed to link arms with mission-minded organizations who, united in faith, offer resources and expertise that support what we do. So join us in welcoming two of these partners. First, Mr. Chap Bettis, founder and author of The Disciple-Making Parent, and Mr. Del Cook, President of the Board of Trustees at Worldview Academy. Thank you both for joining us. As we begin this part of our session, I'm reminded of 1 Chronicles chapter 12, which describes David's mighty men as, quote, men who had an understanding of the times to know what Israel ought to do, unquote. And we also need to understand our times. So let's focus on teens for a minute. Del, what are the big questions that our youth are asking today? Yeah, I think the questions that youth are asking are the questions uh, often that mankind asks. At uh, Worldview Academy, we talk about uh, what a worldview is and uh, what, what it is in its nature and in, in sense uh, how it's structured. And we, we talk about two basic questions that uh, any worldview is formed out of, and it's what is the nature of God and what is the nature of man? And uh, everyone ha asks those questions in one way, shape or form, and the answers that they give are going to shape and form the answers that they have for any other questions that they encounter. And, and I think uh, the two big questions that our teenagers are faced with orient around those those questions significantly. I, I think first would be uh, uh, and, and a profound question that uh, is uh, prevalent in today's cultures. Who am I? 
right? Uh, uh, what identity? Uh, uh, what what defines me as an individual, as a human being? And uh, that manifests itself in lots of uh, various ways. Uh, we we talk about identity politics. We talk about the tribalism and our our connections. Uh, or visions and and so forth, uh, and then it it uh, orients uh, to the big discussion about sexual orientation and uh, uh, gender uh, identity and so forth, uh, oriented around our, our desires. Right, uh, is that at the base of who we are and and uh, defining who we are? So so I'd say those are those. That's one big question, and then. Uh, related to that is the kind of who says, right? Uh, so nature of God, nature of man, who am I and and who says so? Uh, is, is it I that define that uh, or, or is, am I identified or defined from outside of myself? And that plays out in authority as well to uh, how do you know and, and on what grounds, uh, whatever uh, beliefs, assertions or uh, uh, commitments or visions that one has. So to, to my mind, I think those are, those, those are the two big questions that play out in multifarious ways, uh, you know, bioethics, uh, 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 justice, uh, and, and so on. Uh, who am I and, and who says that I am who I am? So what is the nature of God, nature of reality, and, and myself within it? That's great. We hear a lot about Gen Z and the young people who are growing up in that generation. What does a typical Gen Z young person value? Right. I, I'd say uh, uh, it, it, what we seem to uh, uh, see expressed in, in the various ways that they communicate and so forth would orient around a, a sense of justice, right? A, a, a sense of right and wrong. Uh, albeit where that sense is coming from uh, might be uh, might be twisted or <laughs> uh, uh, coming from different directions. But uh, yeah, yeah, a real a real sense of justice. Now, I would also then say as well that what what we mean by justice has lots of different de definitions uh, mm -hmm. and is being played out in lots of different ways. But a sense of justice, I think, a desire for community. Uh, you know, social media and so forth, uh, getting back to that sense of identifying ourselves and, and making connections with others. Uh, FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. <laughs> uh, the, the, those, are, those, those are some values, I suppose, as well. Uh, and then uh, a sense of authenticity, valuing of authenticity uh, for whatever reason of, uh, you know, generation that they have come out of and values along those lines. I think there's a real heightened sense of looking for, uh, looking through any sort of uh, masks uh, that, that we may put on in various ways. And so a, a, a sense of finding the real, right, the true uh, and, and, and the good. And the beautiful, for that matter, talking about transcendent values. Very good. So what are some of the challenges that are facing those same students? Well, I think the challenges then uh, come come in where they're finding their how they're where they're finding and identifying themselves and how they're identifying themselves, where they're finding that community uh, and and how they're uh, how they're identifying that, that sense of justice. Uh, going back then to the who says, I think I would say that the, the challenges that are facing our young young people are, are defining and understanding where where we can understand our identity, uh, how we can understand our identity, not not in terms of attributes that I have or interests that I have, but whose am I right? Who, who am I is uh, oriented and grasped in, in whose I am. You are someone else's in your nature and your being ontologically. Uh, and then and then branching off of that, then who, who is saying and how, how do I uh, understand what is the right and the true and the just uh, path? And, and then wh where, where do I find authentic, authentic community? Yeah. Uh, th th those are the challenges uh, that I think the technology and so forth that are presenting us that uh, we, we can't we can't find those through a screen and and different things like that. Well, Chap, that brings us to you. I so enjoyed reading your book, The Disciple Making Parents. And in that book, you explore both the biblical mandate and the practical methods of discipling our children. So tell us a little bit. Why did you feel called to write that book? 
Well, as a young parent, I had a, a strong desire to be an intentional parent. Um, you know, there are a lot of pressures. There are a lot of fear. Should my daughter take dance, soccer, you know, all these decisions that you're making as a parent. And, and, and so what, what is it? What, is the, what am I aiming at? What's the North Star? Uh, and, and that really drove me back to the Bible uh, to, to say, what, Lord, you've given us direction in your, uh, in your word. Um, and, and what that drove me to was to say, actually, uh, the most foundational issue for us as parenting uh, really is summed up in the Great Commission when we're called to make disciples. And so we send we send uh, we, we take the gospel across the ocean, but we also uh, that applies to our our children as well. So one of the things, you know, realizing that that God's not only has, has given me this little baby, but he's given me an, a, an eternal soul to influence. So I can't control the outcome, uh, whether or not they're going to follow Christ or not. But but I can faithfully and skillfully and, and confidently influence them uh, based on the word of God. So uh, so it started for me. And then knowing that other parents face that uh, those same fears and, and temptations as well. You know, one of the things, uh, you know, parents often, I think moms especially feel like, oh, I'm afraid I'm going to mess up my child. Do you, I don't know if you feel that way, but you know, theologically they come messed up already. So that's just the nature of sin. Uh, so, uh, and so what is that foundation that we build our, our parenting on the scriptures? And so, and so that's, um, that's what prompted me to write it down. That's great. And I would ask all of you, you are all in that blessed stage where you have some adult children now. You've made it through the trenches. So what insights would you give to parents that are in the trenches of discipleship right now? Well, yeah, that's I think just to realize, um, you know, one day right now they're eight. One day they'll be 28. And so where where, you know, life is long. Life is short. Life is very short in some ways. Uh, and so what are we aiming for? And. There are a lot of um, good activities. Good is often the enemy of the best, though. So mm -hmm. what what are we aiming for? Um, and, and to realize ultimately, at the end of the day, we cannot nor should not give everything to our kids. Uh, we want to be Jesus centered, God focused, not child centered. Um, I, I one of my uh, mentors said to me, I, I want my children to know that I live for something greater than them. So having said that, um, Having said that, sort of making the, the Great Commission the North Star, I, I do think there's some special things, uh, some some unique things about the teen years to be aware of. So when they're little kids, we should be telling them what to do. But suddenly the teen years, we need to ask more questions. Um, and, you know, one of the things that Paul says about Timothy, Timothy grew up in a Christian home uh, or a believing home. And Paul said to Timothy, continue in what you've learned and become convinced of. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a very natural time, uh, my life and really 98% of the people I survey uh, where their faith becomes their own. And so realizing that, uh, that um, yeah, we're, we're in that process with, with teenagers. And so just to keep bringing the gospel, bringing, um, bringing reasons for the faith, staying connected to their heart. Um, so, uh, you know, I know we love our kids or they, they, they know we love them, but do we actually like them? So, uh, <laughs> you know, that's, that's just us as parents. And one last thing I'd say is, you know, one of the things, and maybe this is easier in New England, um, where Christians, uh, professing Christians are the minority, but, but just to realize that as our culture changes, we, we want to be, as a family, we want to be cheerfully different. And we are different because we're followers of Christ. And yet it's cheerfulness. It's not the Christian life is not drinking lemon juice. It's really a joy filled life. So those are those are, I think, are some things to stay connected, even realizing that, yeah, they are our 13 year old will one day be 23 and mm -hmm. we want to stay connected to their hearts. That's one of our mottos that we ask our, our kids as they're growing up. Who do you want to be when you're 23? because the decisions you make right now will affect the trajectory of your life. So Kim, do you have any insight that you'd like to add? I do, Amy Joy. You know, my baby is 21, which seems almost impossible, but um, you know, I think it's about staying in relationship mm -hmm. and not being afraid in our, in our parent hearts 
when they question and they wrestle. I think it's about encouraging that um, and trusting God because ultimately he loves them more than we do, yes. which in our humanness, we can't necessarily um, balance. But the reality is they're, for their faith to be their own, they have to go through that. And I know, you know, as a young person myself, um, I was born and raised in the church, good Southern Baptist family that went to church every time the doors were open. But the reality is my faith was not my own until I was 30. Mm -hmm. So parents keep, keep doing what you're doing. Keep digging in and keep, as chat said, bringing them back to scripture, help them wrestle, give them um, opportunities to do that. You know, so many of our, of the statistics we read, talk about students walking away from their faith as they leave their home yes. or when they leave their home. But when they're asked about that, they say they actually changed their mind sometime while they were still home. So encouraging active conversation is the best thing that I can really encourage. I agree. Very good. Um, Del, Worldview Academy interacts with young people in a fun camp environment and that really focuses on relationships. So what are some of the specific things that you do to capture the hearts and minds of young people? Right. We try to emphasize on a couple of different levels uh, through the structure of what we do and, and the content of what we do, uh, mainly focused on, first of all, relationship and face-to-face uh, -face relationship, uh, building a little bit on what uh, 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 has been said earlier here with respect to a, a sense of making it beautiful, right? Uh, th there's truth and there's grace and there's truth and there's love. <clears throat> and we want our students to experience uh, experience the beauty of the gospel and the beauty of uh, tr truth, goodness, and beauty uh, in that respect. And so uh, what we do is we have uh, uh, college staff who uh, more or less make the camp happen, but mainly what they're there for is to build relationships and pour themselves into face-to-face -face conversations, asking questions, uh, engaging in conversation with them throughout the week on whatever uh, content we happen to have been discussing and working on through the course of the week. And, uh, and, and it's just amazing to watch that transition from a Sunday evening through the course of the week as, you know, they, they come in and they don't know anyone and their eyes are just, you know, saucers. What, what in the world's going on around me uh, to, to a, a switch being flipped at some point when they feel uh, and engage and understand that these people here really and truly care about me as an individual. Uh, and, and so face to face conversations almost along those lines. And then also uh, we, we look uh, to, to take the big concepts uh, and, and we call it putting the cookies on the bottom shelf uh, and, and basically uh, through Socratic dialogue and questions and lectures and small groups and so forth. Uh, uh, you let those students have some access to those questions or the big questions of the human condition and, and reality and spirituality. Uh, and, and in a sense, maybe give them the questions to ask, right? Yes. Here's some questions that you can ask in, in, in some way, shape or form uh, that they can begin to ask and begin the conversation. Uh, and um, in, in that context, I think it starts to take shape of a, of a beauty uh, that begins to come around the truth that they're being given. I think there are a lot of insights that we can take from that as parents, mm -hmm. just to be in that relationship and those conversations, not to be afraid of the questions that our young people ask, but to engage them and to, to help them to learn to ask better questions and more questions rather than just feel like we have to have all of the answers. So I know one of the specific right. ways that NCFCA encourages discipleship and that kind of heart-mind connection is through apologetics. So Chap, can you tell us about your own family's experience with apologetics? How did you go about studying that? What impact did it have in the spiritual formation of your children? Yeah, well, I, I just I just love the category. Um, and uh, so I was the uh, the typical... Uh, maybe homeschool father kind of backing into the league, being told I need to come judge and, uh, you know, uh, showing up at tournaments and saying, what are my kids involved in? And okay, okay. And, th but then um, 
uh, my uh, oldest daughter wanted to compete in this category and uh, she wanted some help. She had some other members in a club and we started, I started looking at this and I just thought, man, this is, this is great material. I wish I had had it in high school. Uh, again, some of those questions I had as a young person, not realizing that there were answers out there. Um, and uh, yeah, so we so helped her with that. And uh, that's that's actually where the fearless apologetics curriculum came from. So yeah, all four of my children uh, competed through their high school years, um, and you know some did, some broke, um, so a couple went to nationals, I think, um, and others didn't. You know, competition-wise, they didn't they didn't break. But ultimately, my goal is again, what's the North Star? My goal is that they'd follow Christ. They got to hear answers and we got to we got to talk about it, um, which I, I think is actually the best way this category provides a structure for a family as you study together to have these conversations and for us as adults to learn uh, things that uh, you know we may, we may not know. So uh, just this morning I asked, I asked one son, uh, what impact uh, apologetics that had had on his life. And he re he thought and he said, up until this point, I was accepting Christianity on faith, but afterwards I knew that it was based on evidence. And I think that's, you, okay. there's a chance, to, you, you know, we give our kids AP biology, we give them AP lit sometimes, but we don't give them AP Bible. And so this is a chance to, for, to have some AP Bible where we say, wow, there, there's, there are smart men and women out there who've uh, answer, really gone after all the questions um, and, and we, can, we can talk about those. So, so really one intended audience, I think, as we participate in this, um, in this category, uh, it, it, we got young people listening in now and adults, but one, one, uh, one intended audience is my heart, at the heart of the child, the mm -hmm. heart of the student. Um, and if you're listening in and you've got doubts, that's a great category to dig, it's, to dig into those questions. And then, in other words, as well as to equip them to speak to other Christians, um, and then to speak to non-Christians as well. So I, I just can't say enough about the category. I love it. The event. That's great, Kim. You mentioned earlier about those studies talking about students who are walking away from the faith, and and I am a scientist. So you know the numbers are kind of staggering. Some people say 65. Some people say 88 percent of of students are walking away from their faith the first year and in college. And the question that I always asked was, tell me about the 12%, right? Tell me about the other students who are following Christ in college. And one of the things that the, that research shows is that it has a lot to do with, do they really understand the why they believe as much as they understand the what they believe? So um, wait for just a moment for Kim to catch up. All right. Well, we'll go on here. Do, do you have any fear, though, that, that studying apologetics will encourage students to question their faith, maybe in an unhealthy way? Um, no, I, I, I mean, I think if it's done right, it, it strengthens the faith because, um, uh, you know, one, one study that I've looked at said that 40 percent of young people were having their first questions in junior high. So it's not a it's not a, we're not introducing questions that our young people are not having. They're just not asking them. And that, that was true for me as well. Uh, they were just they were like a low level fever that was bothering me, but I never actually articulated it. So so to bring up the questions in a safe environment and, and then with this confidence that Christianity has the answers. If When you look at the evidence for the resurrection, you look at the evidence for the veracity of the, the New Testament uh real someone said i don't have enough faith to be an atheist and and it really is true that you look at the evidence they re it really is overwhelming and uh yeah so i i don't i don't think there's any um any problem in fact we're bringing it up in a safe environment and and saying look there there are kind smart non-christians and that shouldn't throw you off yeah. because this every question they're going to throw at you has been asked before, and uh, and we want you to be a thinking person. We don't want you just to to blindly believe something that's not true. Mm -hmm. That's great, Dell. Can you speak to that parent who has struggled with discipling, and now their teenager is either apathetic or antagonistic toward the faith? What what hope can you give to these parents? 
uh, I, I would give hope to them uh, in one sense uh, from uh, maybe the uh, anecdotal, but 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 I think strong anecdotal uh, evidence that I've seen in my 25 years of uh, uh, being involved in education and working with uh, um, teenagers as they go through that process of owning their faith, that quite, quite often uh, that that seeking to own the faith and and coming to terms with that and as chap mentioned that 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 faith that of Timothy that had become his own uh, looks like uh, often apathy it looks like maybe uh, walking away right uh, and so I would encourage them to say that the path they're walking is not a path that has been untrodden uh, before uh, <laughs> they're walking walking in a path that 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 has gone before them. Uh, and then secondly, uh, so take hope and encouragement in that and then continually uh, keep that relationship, right? Uh, don't, don't push them away or don't let them, don't let them push themselves away. Uh, uh, keep leaning in and keep being a part of their life, asking questions, maintaining relationship uh, and, uh, and, 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 keep, and making it beautiful. Uh, as we've been talking before, you make it faithful and make a beautiful chap mentioned that, uh, that statement that, you know, the sense of, I love you and I dig you, right. I like you too. Uh, I, I, I jokingly say, uh, oh, I don't say it's half jokingly. It's, it's, it's true. I, I, I know. And, 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 and at reality, it's sad. I know parents that would die for their children, but they don't want to be around them. Right. Uh, they lay down their life for them, but they, they love them, but they don't like them. And so uh, to the degree that that student can know that I, I dig you and I like you and I, I, I would lay down my life for you and love you uh, and 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 keep keep the pathways of question available uh, through engaging them with questions uh, and and then and then trust. Right. And, and trust uh, God and his timing. Uh, in that respect, and and he is faithful. His word is is true and faithful. Kim, you mentioned that you were about thirty when you finally came to that saving faith in Jesus Christ and made that decision to follow Him. So, how would you encourage a young person who is struggling with doubt or disbelief? You know, Amy Joy, I think it's about what Dale and Chap have both mentioned, and it's staying staying with it continuing to dig even when there there is no um, apparent answer. Like if you're not, if you're just not getting there fast enough, the answers aren't coming. Um, you feel like the Lord is silent. I mean, we, you and I talked recently about um, there being long periods in, in scripture where the Lord was silent. Um, but for us to continue to, to dig in, um, I mentioned to club leaders this year at nationals, you know, our job as parents, as an organization for them, as club leaders, is really to plant a seed. And that's our job, plant the seed, we tend it, we cover it up, we water it, and we wait. And sometimes we wait a long time. And the phrase that came to mind as I was presenting that that somebody said that was really helpful was sometimes it just looks like dirt for a long time. Right. So I, I think, you know, it's about being faithful in the small things, planting the seed, tending it, loving them, liking them, staying in relationship with them. Don't abandon it. Mm -hmm. And then the fruit will come. That's great. I think I might also add that, that, that in that, in that asking questions, uh, of them, I think, uh, you know, questions like, uh, what do you mean by, we talk about four uh, questions at Worldview Academy engaging with other worldviews. Uh, what, what do you mean by, how do you know, what difference does it make, and what if you're wrong, right? <laughs> <laughs> those four questions, and, and, and not, not in a, not in a uh, wooden way that we ask those questions, but those types of questions that a person, if they're seeking, that they you can take them down a path of whatever worldview, whatever pathway that they may be going, and you know, kind of reductio ad absurdum in some way, uh, that they can begin to reach a sense of man, th th this takes this takes me nowhere, right? Mm -hmm. That takes me nowhere. I'm going to bump up against reality in one way, shape, or form, and then when they uh, reach that 
that dead band in a sense, that's when the gospel is, uh, is ready to be received. That's great. Chap, do you have any thoughts that you want to add there? Well, I, I agree with everything that was said. Uh, I just, the only thing I would add is that doubt and, and unbelief are two different things. Mm -hmm. So uh, all of us have doubts. Um, and, uh, you know, we feed our, on the word of God and, and, and the reasons, again, the more you study, I think the more you will become convinced. And we also need to, to doubt our doubts, which is to say, um, if you don't like the Christian answer to why is there evil, then what else do you find out there that's satisfying? And the answer, of course, I would say is nothing. Uh, so, you know, Peter said to Jesus, to whom shall we go? You have the words of eternal life. Unbelief is different. So that's that's a, well. And the last thing I'd say to the young person who's listening in with with doubts is to say, welcome to the club. Welcome to adulthood. <laughs> uh, you know, I get on a roller. I get on a roller coaster and it's that one ninety nine percent. I know that it's going to bring me back safe, but there's that, that's the part of the scariness to say, you know, even in my heart going, yeah, I'm getting on this roller coaster, even though, uh, yeah, you know, you're not a hundred percent convinced. Having said that, disp unbelief, I think is different. So that's the, that's a settled disposition that I'm not going to believe. Uh, my own senior pastor talks about, um, that he was angry at God as a teen and he turned his back on the Lord. He just, it was a deliberate act. And so that's, and to that, I, to that teen, whether because of the enjoyment of sin or anger, you know, I'd say the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, and uh, and ultimately, ultimately down the road, sin has consequences, yeah. and Jesus is the one who came came to give abundant life. So the Christian life is is can be difficult, but it is the best life. That's great. I love that. Well, we're going to move into a time of question and answer. And we have over a hundred friends who have joined in today. So we'll just take some time to answer their questions. The first one is from Emmy and she asks, what are your positions in the NCFCA and how did you first get involved? I'll pick that one up first since I suppose mine is the most obvious. Um, I serve as executive director, which means I have oversight of the, um, all the um, areas of the league that would, um, be things like competition, just the business side. We have all our registration. Um, we have our great work with our partners, which you see on the screen. Um, so it's a, an exciting job. Great. You're asking what my position is? I'm yes. <laughs> NCFCA dad. Very yes. <laughs> For, former former uh, state rep. And Chap, how long have you been involved in the league? Well, uh, our kids did it through their homeschool career. So uh, 16 years. Wow, that's great. And Dell, how did you first encounter NCFCA? Well, yeah, I would uh, characterize myself as a friend of N NCFCA uh, and a fan, a, fr a friend and a fan. Uh, and uh, my, my interaction with NCFCA began about a year and a half ago uh, with some communication with Kim with respect to uh, our partnership with uh, uh, Worldview Academy, and uh, and then had the have had the opportunity to uh, uh, speak at the most recent national championships in Anderson, South Carolina. Great, very good. Well, we have another question from Emma. She says, "If you created another secondary motto, what would it be?" Hmm. It is a motto of NCFCA. Let me think. Mm. <laughs> There's a lot of science behind creating monitors. <laughs> what I will say here is, is that we are actually in a process of doing some strategic planning. Um, Christy suggested, you know, here we've been now for, for 25 years as a debate organization. NCFCA is 20 years old this year. And so it's time for us to to really examine, and we've been doing that over the last couple of years of, of why we exist, and we're very sure of that. And so now we're into a, a place of looking at, you know, how, how do we stay relevant? Now, not in, in worldly terms, but how do we stay relevant to um, be able to provide what's best for our affiliates? So we're actually working on a lot of things like that. So you might see a secondary motto come up. Mm -hmm in the near future. Yep. Yeah. 
I'd say something like training students to communicate for Christ, something simple like that. Mm -hmm. um, because, and, and I've loved what I've been hearing through this whole session. Um, you can't communicate for Christ if you don't know Christ. That's right. So we really want to just exude him and his truth and his love. And we as leaders want to, as best as we can, we are not perfect, we're human, but we want to show each of our participants the love of Christ as best as we can, how much he loves each and every one of you. Um, we want you to know that. We want you to know him. And when you know him, we want you to share what you know with other people. That's great. I love that. Michelle asks, is NCFCA an American only organization? Do you extend your vision and mission to our Northern neighbor, Canada? <laughs> We've actually had um, several Canadian families join us over the years. Um, currently our competitions are all within the contiguous United States and with our friends out in Hawaii. Um, so, um, if you're if you're able to come across the border and I understand that most Canadians live within 100 miles of our border. So that's a really cool opportunity for you to come over and uh, and participate with us. So if you have that option, then I would say absolutely. Yes. Come on over. That's great. Yes. <laughs> and I would say it's within oh. the realm of possibility in the future that we would expand. But for now, our program is just in the US. That's great. Thanks, Christy. <laughs> Kathy asks, how can I start a group here in Iowa? It's a really good question. Um, we have a lot of resources and um, I'll bounce that one right back at you, Amy Joy, because mm -hmm. Amy Joy as our director of education really is the, um, the touch point for those who would like to start a club or start a group or um, have their family participate. So um, I would encourage you to reach out She's Amy Joy Tofty at ncfca.org. Great. Yes, and I would love to invite you, Kathy, to another session that we're having. Session five is called Launching Clubs and Classes. That's at 10 a.m. on Tuesday morning. And so if you do have folks that have been interested in starting NCFCA clubs elsewhere, that's a great place for them to start. And then I would love to have a personal conversation with anyone who is interested in that. Emma asks, Certain competition categories, like apologetics, are clearly mission-minded. But what about the other categories? How should students embrace the mission in each of those different categories of competition, including debate? I'll take that one. <laughs> um, I'm on the debate committee for NCFCA and have written the debate curriculum. I think debate and all of our events are an excellent fit for this kind of worldview training that we want you to do because every one of our events involves critical thinking. And, you know, one thing that strikes me is that God created us with minds, with the ability to know things, but he didn't automatically just magically make us know things. And he chose to communicate to us primarily um, through a book. So we need to learn skills of reading and analyzing and thinking. I believe that debate skills have greatly helped me and a lot of my students learn how to read the Bible better, learn how to apply scripture to my life and to the lives of my students. Um, so the kind of reasoning and skills that you're doing in debate translate very well to your personal study of scripture um, to all of your conversations that you might have with, with anyone. I mean, I just can't tell you, I, I use the skills that I've gained in debate every single day as a Christian. And then just communication skills in general, which every one of our events is about. Um, you know, the Bible commands us to go and make disciples and to tell people how can they believe without hearing. So not only are we as Christians um, commanded to read and study, but also to speak. And mm -hmm. all of those skills can be learned in our league and in, in any of our events. That's great. Kim, do you have any thoughts you'd like to add? Um, 
No, I, I think Christy really uh, encompassed that. You know, I, I think debate really provides an opportunity um, for our students to learn to reason well, to learn to research, um, to be able to, again, kind of dig in and uh, acquire the skills that it takes to be able to be articulate. It's about knowing God, mm -hmm. knowing who he is, and then applying it to um, all other areas of life. You know, as, as Del mentioned, worldview is not just about um, Sunday and Wednesday. And mm -hmm. I think that, you know, in, in my own story, that's what it was. It was, you know, church was church and everything else was everything else. Mm -hmm. um, but the two didn't didn't mesh in my head. So I think debate really gives us an opportunity to, to mesh those those two ideas together. One of the most impactful moments in the league for me was I was watching a, a speech and the student gave two different stories that were kind of polar opposite stories and was showing the contrast between them. And there was a community judge sitting next to me. And through that speech, the young man presented the gospel message, but he did it through the art of story. And so as I think about interpretation speeches, I just think about how powerful stories are. Um, we pass down stories to our children. It's what creates the cultures in our families and in our churches is those shared experiences, those shared stories. Um, when the student was done, the community judge that was sitting next to me just froze. And he held his pen, pen in his hand for what seemed like an eternity. And finally, he turned and looked at me and he said, well, I guess that'll give me something to think about. So <laughs> even if our, our students... Uh, look at interpretation and, and you know, we're just acting out stories. No, you're doing so much more than just acting out stories. You're capturing the good and the true and the beautiful in the art of stories and, and giving that to a, an audience in a way that they can receive it. So I definitely see aspects of our mission in each of the categories. And Emma, I do want to encourage you that throughout the rest of this day, we're going to start now breaking down each of our events. And one of the things we're going to look at is how does each one of these events um, fulfill our mission in this league. So I hope you can join us for those. Our next question is, how do you balance speech and debate with everyday life? Mm -hmm. I can tell you how I do it because I, I might be unique <laughs> in the league, but, um, and I started it. So <laughs> it, I don't, I treat it as an extracurricular activity. So I've had three of my children graduate from high school and two that one is eligible to compete and one is still too young. So that's where I'm at in my, with my five kids. And the, so the three that have um, participated and graduated, I treated it as an extracurricular. So you have to get all of your schoolwork done and then you can work on speech and debate. And that was just what was, was best for our family because I wanted to give them a full um, high school education. I know that like, for example, sometimes I didn't do a social studies course right when they're doing debate because our history that year was the Middle East or whatever. <laughs> so there's definitely some ways um, you can count a lot of what you do in speech and debate as high school credit. Um, but most of it we did extracurricular and we only did two qualifying tournaments a year and then if you qualified to regionals, we'd go to regionals. And then if you qualified to nationals, to nationals. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we've ever done more than those four in a year. Great. Kim? And, you know, I think Amy Joy with that, that's really kind of at the heart. You know, the question being, how do you balance this with everyday life? Um, our students and families have more and more opportunities today that are excellent. Um, and they want to give them a well-rounded opportunity. And so I really think that our new tournament structures for um, some of the two-day tournaments are really going to be helpful to families in that way. Yeah, and I know as a mom of students that are still actively in the debate trenches, um, we call it time boxing. There's a limited amount of time that we're going to devote to this activity because I still want you to eat and sleep and exercise and do math. Do math. Mm -hmm good one. Um, so we do it by time and you can do as much research as you want to do in this amount of time. But as Chap said earlier, the good is often the best is the, often the enemy of the best. And so we have to be careful for letting Amen. this grow out of control. Um, that's, that's 
our job as parents is to help our students to know how to find that that work life faith balance. So our next question is when you judge, what is the most important thing that you look for? Mm, we have a whole session on that coming up, don't we? We do. <laughs> no, we do. So if you want to join us again for session 13, that's on providing meaningful feedback. Would any of you like to just touch on that for just a second? Sure. I mean, so I'm looking for real world communication style. That's probably my number one other than substance. So when I'm just talking about the speech quality itself, I'm looking for um, not for fast talking, other debate leagues in particular, encourage or reward getting in as many arguments as possible as fast as you can talk. I'm not looking for that. I'm looking for training in real world communication style. So I'm looking for that in all of the events for them to be for students to speak in a way that connects to me as a person. You're you're speaking to a human being. So it's not just about, oh, check this thing. I did that and I did that and I did that. It was a great speech. It really needs to connect from human to human. Um, That's right. Yeah. Thank you, I appreciate that. And just to tell you the time on that session, providing meaningful feedback will be Thursday at 10 a.m. We have a couple of other questions, so we'll touch on these briefly, but I do just want to mention that a lot of these now are going to be addressed in other sessions. This question is, can you address the heart and the ideas behind the rule that the entire original source material must be suitable? So just help address the ambiguity there. Absolutely. I, you know, I think we've, we've really centered on who we are and why we exist. Um, so for that reason, as subject matter or material is chosen for competition, even if you cut a part that is acceptable and within the rules, the whole source material is really um, looked at by your audience, okay? Not, not necessarily at that moment, but if they, they see something um, from a book, an interpretation, and they think, oh, that sounds exciting. I think I'd like to go and read that. To send them back to um, a book that really is not appropriate and doesn't help us meet our mission um, is really the heart behind that rule. That's great. I just wanted to also add that we have some additional sessions on speeches. So diving into the new speech events is on Wednesday at 12 o'clock. Designing dynamic speeches is at 2 p.m. And changing lives one story at a time is at, at 4 p.m. So I just want to encourage you to come back for those so that um, you can hear those and, and we'll talk more about those issues. Uh, Del, do you want to talk at all about literature and just the value of good literature in a student's life? Yes, uh, you know, as we talk about uh, NCFCA and its its goal to put uh, rich and good words in the mind and heart and mouth of a student so that they can speak them winsomely, articulately to whatever issue happens to be at, at hand in their lives or in, at the day. Uh, literature, I think, uh, is is profound in its uh, uh, influence in, in developing those skills um, for a couple reasons. Uh, one, the, the literature is is not just entertaining. You know, gr the great books, the great literature, uh, they're not just entertaining, although they are entertaining. Uh, but they're they're the well, I, I, we say at Worldview Academy that when we tell stories. Uh, it's a it's a uniquely human quality and thing that we do. And when we tell stories, we we are basically echoing the the story, right? The story that we inhabit as as uh, as create uh, creations of God who who has spoken us into existence. Mm -hmm. And so so to tell a story is to is to try to answer a question, right? To tell a story is to figure things out and to who we are and what reality is and so forth, the questions of the human condition. And so as, as students read great literature, they're, they're conversing with uh, the great minds of, of, uh, of the past who are taking on those big questions. And, and so there's a content 
connection in, in what they're doing. And there's also a form uh, connection. Uh, you know, great literature uses great words greatly. And I know I didn't use great words greatly when I just did that. Uh, but, uh, uh, but, but they use great words in, uh, uh, well. And, uh, and, and so the, the, the reading of great words elevates our own language. Uh, and, and places those words in our mind and heart so that we're equipped to speak words well uh, to whatever we happen to be speaking of. And so that's going to take, you know, have profound impact in whatever a student happens to be speaking on, whether it be teen, uh, uh, teen um, uh, gosh. Uh, team policy? Team, team policy, yes, thank you. Right, yeah, team policy debate. And you're taking on uh, a question of uh, energy uh, of, a, of a proposal. Well, listen, literature will play into that, right? Liter liter great literature will play into that in giving you uh, resources to, to answer and uh, address that question. So I just wanted to ask Cap a brief question. So we're going to bring him back with us. Kim, while we wait for chap, we just do have a couple of questions that are addressed specifically to you. So okay, if you okay. want to touch base on these briefly, why are speeches limit, limited at national events for students who compete in moot court? Oh, that's a great question and a new question. Yes. Um, it really stems back to the idea of really look, trying to limit uh, the amount of time that a tournament takes. The reality is, um, when we added moot court, it adds a great skill set, um, but it also added some additional challenges in terms of um, the length of the tournament. So limiting the number of speech events for, moot, for mooters is going to allow us to put moot court in the speech patterns. So now for every speech pattern, you'll have a round of moot court available as well. Great. That's fantastic. And... And will these different tournament structures, two days versus three days, will they have different at-large points? They actually um, will not have different at-large points. Qualification sure. committee has been, has been working really hard on that, but um, that particular point has been determined. So look for the rest of our qualification um, details to come out in the next month or so. That's great. Chap, I just wanted to end with a question. We were speaking about the value of literature and why it's so important to the NCFCA that our students are reading good literature. And, and Chap made a comment, Del made a comment about um, literature helping to, to shed light on the story. So every smaller story tells a greater story. How do you see that connection to apologetics? So as our kids read really great literature, how does that then help them to build bridges to the people around them for the topic of apologetics and for evangelizing other folks? Well, I think, I'm not sure if this is answering your question exactly, um, but, uh, you know, God, God has designed us. We resonate with stories. Jesus uh, told um, stories as illustrations, they stick with us, they stick with the heart. And, and you know, an one thing apologetics does, the rational sort of goes in through the front door and arts, including um, including uh, stories, music, et cetera, sort of goes around and gets to our imagination. And we, we really haven't talked about that today, um, but, but, you know, part of uh, the way we disciple our kids is 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 realizing the influence of the imagination. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, I love apologetics. That I'm passionate about it, but it's it needs to be supplemented with uh, the imagination and uh, the um, an apologetics for the imagination, if you want to call that. So God has just designed us where we resonate with stories, and uh, and we need to take advantage of that. See us well, here. C.S. Okay. Lewis used to, oh, I wanted to put in a great quote by C.S. Lewis, what happened, yeah. you know, whenever <laughs> he talked in terms of narrative, stealing past the watchful dragons of the intellect, uh, you know, when we, in, in disbelief, right, when we are uh, putting up that wall and, and, and committed to not believing, uh, narrative and story slips past and you don't even know that you're being argued on. Uh, yeah. And uh, yeah, there's a power there. 
Well, we want to thank all of you for being here today. As we close, I would love for you to take a moment to type one takeaway thought from embracing the mission in our chat box. We'd love to hear what you're taking away from this session. My takeaway is that NCFCA is passionate about supporting parents who are discipling their children. And they seek to train godly communicators who both stand firm in truth and point people to Christ. So I'm reminded of the words that the Apostle Paul prayed in Ephesians 1. He says, I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. And I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in his holy people, and is incomparably great power for those who believe. That is our passion at the NCFCA for you. So thank you so much, speakers, for sharing the mission of NCFCA and the mission of discipleship. Thank you to our Summit 2019 production manager, Mrs. Natalia Rosa, and to the University of Northwestern, our gracious hosts. And to you, our listening audience, thank you for joining us. For additional summit session times, please visit www.ncfca.org forward slash 2019-online-summit. And until we see you again, keep embracing the mission.